Around three years ago, I created a cover of Boards of Canada's Roy Biv. While it's not the most popular video on this channel, it's the one that I enjoyed making the most, as well as have enjoyed reading all of the lovely comments that this video has received over the last several months. But if there's ever been one comment that I've been asked specifically over and over, it's been from people who have been pleading for me to finally reveal just how on earth I managed to coax the coveted Roy Biv bass sound out of the microcorg. Well today, I'm finally going to reveal to you how I did it. How's it going everybody? My name is Ian Felpel. I'm a music producer, sound designer, and multi-instrumentalist. I also stream every week on Twitch, and while I'm not yet streaming music production sessions over there, although that's ultimately part of my goals, I've been having a lot of fun just chilling with the community, getting some creative inspiration for new projects, as well as just frankly having some stupid fun playing some good video games, both old and new, that I've currently been enjoying. You can find the link to that stream in the description below, along with all my social media outlets, as well as places where you can find my music. This is a sound that needs little to no introduction whatsoever. Fans around the world have loved this sound for the last 20 years, and producers have spent just as much time hotly speculating over it, ruminating over it, discussing it, and you can find a plethora of tutorials on it, both here on YouTube, on Reddit, or any other music forum that is dedicated to electronic music. But I'm giving you this tutorial in what's perhaps the strangest time in our current history. This is a time where artists are not touring because shows are getting canceled, where artists, session musicians, and producers cannot get together in recording studios because they've been closed for the foreseeable future, unless you're lucky enough to have a home studio. If there has ever been a time where we need music, or even if there's ever been a better time to start getting into music, that time is now. So with all of that in mind, I'm not just going to reveal to you how I made this patch on the microcord. I'm literally going to try to explain why and how this sound works so that regardless of what skill level you're at, whether you're a beginner or a veteran, whether you work with digital synths or analog ones, hardware, software, whether you've got a $10,000 modular synthesis rig, or you're using free plugins on your doll, doesn't matter. I'm hoping that you at least can take away something that you can use on your future projects, or even hopefully be able to replicate this sound in the synthesizer of your choice. Let's head over to my studio and let's get down to business, shall we? So before we get into this sound, it would be a good idea just to discuss in brief what type of synth Boards of Canada may have used to create this sound in the first place. The main culprit that a lot of people point to is the Roland SH-101. This is a monophonic analog synth that was produced in the early 1980s, but enjoyed a huge resurgence in the 1990s among artists like Aphex Twin, Square Pusher, The Future Sound of London, and most likely Boards of Canada themselves. Obviously, we're not working with an SH-101. I personally have never used the synth in my entire life, but I did use that synth as an inspiration in order to help guide me into figuring out how this sound was composed to help limit the types of waveforms and filters that I could actually use. That said, let's actually get this set up. So as I say in every single tutorial, pick a patch that you don't mind overriding on the microcorg and hit shift and then three. It's going to ask if you want to initialize the patch. So hit three again to confirm it. And now we have a blank patch, a blank canvas on which we'll paint our beautiful base on. First, we'll go up to edit select one and head down to voice. The only two settings we're going to change in here is to set our voice assigned from poly to mono. That will basically create our monophonic synth in which we can only play one note at a time. We're also going to set our trigger mode from single over to multi. And basically what the trigger mode does is it dictates how the envelopes on the filter and amplitude, once we get to it later, how they re-trigger once you already have a note held down on the keyboard and you play a second note. So essentially if you have it on single and you're already holding down a note that has been triggered and hold down a second note, it won't re-trigger the envelope so you can play it in a legato fashion. The so multi, it will re-trigger the envelope on every single note regardless of whether you're already holding down a note in the first place. Secondly, we'll head over to pitch. And the only things I have changed in here is to change our vibrato intensity down to zero. This essentially 
turns off the mod wheel down here so that way we're not adding any vibrato to our sound but that's up to you as to whether or not you want to change that and secondly we're going to actually transpose the sound down an octave or minus 12 semitones technically all you would have to do is hit the down key on the octave shift over here to be able to reach down into the bass registers on this synth but I'm just going to set up at negative 12 by default, just so that way I can work with the sound here in the middle of the keyboard. And the very last thing we're going to do is actually jump down to our Edit Select 2 down here, and we're going to go over to our Pegiator. And on our first knob here, which adjusts the tempo, we're going to set it from 120 all the way down to 88 beats per minute. So now we can get into the fun stuff of finally talking about the oscillators. Now on the original SH-101, you had a choice of mixing between four sources. You had a sawtooth, a square wave, a sub oscillator that was also set to a square wave in which you could select it to be at either an octave or two down, as well as your noise generator. Basically speaking, those are the sources that we have to deal with. So anything else on the microcorg that's not a square wave or a sawtooth, we're not going to deal with at all. I will tell you up front that there is no sawtooths in this sound, so we're strictly going to be working with square waves for this patch. So under oscillator one, we're going to go to our first knob here and set our waveform from sol to square. And just so we can talk a little bit about square waves, I'm going to turn on my oscilloscope over here so that way we can take a look at what the waveform looks like with a square wave. So let's just say I hold down a simple C note. Already what you can see on the graph is that it's looking like a square. It looks like a perfect rectangular shape. It has on the screen between the top and the bottom part of the waveform, the width between the two are equal to one another. This width, by the way, is what we refer to as the pulse width. And this is actually something that you can change on a square wave. So over on our second knob here, this actually changes the pulse width. And what will basically happen is as I move this knob up, it's basically going to squish the top part of the wave while the bottom part of the wave elongates. And just so you hear how this sounds, I'm going to play down the C again while moving this knob. You can kind of see on the waveform that the square wave is kind of getting pinched at the left side until it completely disappears. And sonically, you can also hear the sound get a little tinnier, a little buzzier, the higher up we move the pulse width position. Just as a side note, for all of you retro video game nerds out there like me, this is also the type of stuff that video game composers back in the 1980s were working with. You probably recognize this little number. But the other thing that you can do with this pulse width is we can actually set a signal to modulate the position of this pulse width. So we can actually move it back and forth to create some interesting motion in the sound. So what we're going to do here is set our pulse width up to around 53. And to my knowledge, I don't think you can independently set the pulse width on the SH-101, but I'm doing so here merely because back in the time that I was creating this cover, that sounded the best to my ears in terms of getting close to the original sound. And what our third knob here is going to do is adjust the intensity of modulation on the pulse width. And we're going to set this up to around 31. It's going to be just enough to where we're definitely going to hear it move. So right now, it's sounding something like this. And I'm actually going to stop it right there because my ears can't listen to that for so long, but you can slowly hear the modulation working. Well, we want that modulation to move faster. Now, by default on the microcorg, our LFO1 is actually changing the modulation of the pulse width. So we're going to quickly head over there and get this set up. We'll leave the first knob on a triangle because I want it to move up and down with our modulation. We're also not going to set any key sync up. So this is basically kind of similar to the re-triggering thing on the pitch. You can have the LFO re-trigger on every single key press. I'm not going to get that set up, but we are going to tempo sync our LFO, which is why I asked you in the first place to set the tempo to 88 beats per minute. I quite like how the sound works at a setting of 3 sixteenths. It's going to be moving the modulation over 3 sixteenth notes, and this is what it sounds like. The reason I'm spending so much time explaining this is because this is the secret to the Roy G. Biv sound. I know so many producers who 
understand that there's some detuning going on that sounds almost orchestral, but at the same time, there's a bit of grit, a bit of bite and a growl to it. So what I've seen a lot of producers think is that, oh, well, we have one oscillator we can set up and then set an identical one detuned a little bit or by putting the synth in unison mode to have two identical voices with one slightly detuned from the other. So that way it's creating some movement in the sound. Or we can just slap on a chorus effect in our processing chain and maybe some distortion or saturation to gritty up the sound. That's not how this works. Literally that thickness and the grittiness, it's literally just created by modulating the pulse width. That's how simple this is, but it's such a cool effect. And it gets even better because remember I said that the SH-101 had an option for a sub oscillator? Well, we can set that up in oscillator two. So over on our oscillator two, we're also going to set this to a square wave. And the only thing we're going to care about is this third knob here because we want to tune this oscillator down an octave or minus 12 semitones. Now, by default, you're not going to be able to hear this because over on our mixer, we need to turn the level of oscillator two up all the way. And while we're here, since you can add noise in the SH-101, I don't know if Boards of Canada added noise at all to the sound, but I'm going to add just a hair of noise. I'm literally just going to set it to one. So now we have a sound that sounds like this. So already this is sounding really rich and really complex. So if we go over here to the filter setting, by default, the microcorg likes to set the filter at a 12 dB low pass. And while this gives a gentler slope to the cutoff frequency, I'm going to change it to 24. For me, it gives a darker, mellower sound that I actually think works perfectly for this Roy G Biv patch. On our cutoff, you can experiment with this a little bit to see where you like having it placed at. But I'm going to roll it all the way down to around 52. It really rolls off those high frequencies nicely and makes it feel a little smooth like molasses or smooth like butter. However, whatever adjective you want to use to describe it, that's what I'm going to describe it as. Our resonance basically boosts the overtones that are at the cutoff frequency, but we're actually going to turn that down all the way to literally just one. So just to hear it without any resonance, and then to hear it in with one. It's just barely adding in some sparkle at the cutoff frequency. But if I were to go any higher with it, for me, it would be making the sound a little too bright for my taste. The other settings we've got here is to set the intensity of our filter envelope, which we're going to do right now, because it's going to be the very next thing we're going to work with. We're going to set that up to 21. You can play around with this and experiment with however intense you want to make the sound, but I find 21 to be a really solid starting place. I'm also going to set our filter key tracking up to around 28, and all that's going to do is basically the higher up on the keyboard you play, it's going to open up the filter a little bit more. It's going to let more of those high frequencies in. It's not going to do too much to our sound, given that we're only working with a few notes to begin with, but it creates enough interest in the sound that I like. Now, with our filter EG, or our filter envelope generator, it's basically going to create some movement with the cutoff frequency of the filter. So what we're going to make out of this is we're going to make the sound kind of pluck a bit as though you're plucking a string on a bass guitar. That's going to be the effect that we're going to have here. We're not going to add in any attack or release on this. I strictly want to have the decay and then to have the sound sustain at the very end of the decay. So with the decay, we're going to set this right around 90. At shorter values, it's going to pluck extremely fast, while longer values like this, it's just going to slowly draw out. And then for our sustain, we're going to bring this down to around 70. Both of these settings I would encourage you to experiment around with, but if you want to do it the way that I did it, this is the way that I figured it out. So now if we go in and play this sound, You hear how it kind of just opens up at the beginning and then slowly mellows out. That's exactly what we want. 
And what we're going to do further is go to our amplitude envelope and create the same exact shape. So we're going to affect how loud our sound is just to accentuate this pluck a bit. Likewise, there's going to be no attack, although on the release, I put it around five. I don't actually know that it does anything. I just figured I'd put it in to very quickly let the note release as soon as I take off a note. Again, play around with that as you please. We'll set our decay a little longer up to around 100 and then bring in our sustain to around 85. So now this is what we've got. And that right there already is the main gist of the patch. We could technically end the tutorial right here. But of course, knowing me three years ago, I like to be a little flamboyant with my sounds and I enjoyed putting as much on as I possibly could to really thicken it up. For the rest of you who want to see exactly what else I did to make this sound, here's all the optional stuff for you. We're going to go down to LFO2 and we're going to change our waveform to a sample hold generator. For those of you who remember the tutorials I did on Boards of Canada back in the day, I enjoyed using a sample hold generator on an LFO, which technically creates some random noise that I would then apply very minimally to the pitch. So to create some instability in the sound, create, make it sound a little bit like it's coming out of a cassette, if you will. So we're not going to have this tempo synced or key synced, but I am going to bring down our rate to around 55. And then if we jump down here to edit select two, go to patch one, we're going to change our modulation source over to LFO two. We're going to leave it on the pitch and we're only going to bring the modulation intensity up to around two. Now I'm telling you right now, there's really not a difference with putting this on here. You're not going to really hear much, but. It's just creating the tiniest bit of pitch inconsistencies just to create a little bit of movement, give a little bit of a unique sound. Secondly, even though I spent probably five minutes trying to convince you why you should not need to put chorusing on this bass because of the pulse width modulation, well, I did put a little bit of chorusing on back in 2017. I have it set to our flanger here, which at very low values will actually act as a chorus effect. We'll push the rate up to around 29, and then our effect depth up to 15. So this is the sound with chorusing. And then this is it without it. So I don't find anything wrong with putting a chorus on at a low value. You don't want it to be overwhelming. You just want it to add enough to thicken up the sound a bit. But again, that's not something that you really need to do. Another trick that I also enjoyed doing at the time was with our delay. I had it set to a left right setting. Now I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to hear it in stereo because I had the synth plugged in just in the mono jack right now. If we have it on left right. We're not going to tempo sync it. We keep the delay time right where it's at and then just turn the effect depth up to around 16. Listen what happens when I take off the note. Can you hear it? It's just creating a little bit of an echo. It's kind of like a fake reverb, although I will tell you that in Ableton when I recorded this piece, I did throw on a reverb on this bass in that software. So I would highly recommend just throwing a reverb on there instead of messing around with the delay. But again, it's pretty cool, pretty retro sounding. I kind of like it. So there you have it. Thanks again for watching this video. If you have found it helpful in any way, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also comment below if you're using this sound anywhere as I would love to see the types of things that you guys are creating during this time. And if you want to see more content like this along with any other musical things that I'm doing, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell so you'll be the first in line whenever I drop a new video. Thanks again for watching, and unless I see you in my stream, I hope to see you next time in the next video. Take care, everybody.